Right, let me get ready for the next. Right, it's uh, um, now my pleasure to introduce the plenary speaker for session 12, and that is Dr. Eric Galbraith. Dr. Galbraith is a research professor at the Catalan Institute for Research and Advanced Studies based at the Autonomous University of Barcelona, Spain. His research is broadly interdisciplinary and is generally concerned with using numerical models and data analysis to better understand the interactions between climate change, human activities, and the marine ecosystem. His current research focuses on models, sorry, methods for including, including fishing activity as an integral part of marine ecosystem models better understand linkages with biogeochemistry and to inform future projections. So it's a perfect continuation to the previous discussion. <laughs> Dr. Galbraith will be presenting Fish MIP, a community effort to improve the realism and utility of fishery and marine ecosystem models. If you would like to ask a question following the presentation, please remember again where the microphones will be in the aisles. Eric. <clears throat> Great, thanks very much, Manuel, and thanks to the organizers, the uh, session 12 organizers for inviting me to give this talk, and to Sarah for that great lead up, that's perfect. Um, actually, I'm not gonna talk about what Manuel just said I was gonna talk about. <laughs> that was the workshop on Sunday. Um, I'm actually gonna talk about getting the big picture in focus, which is going to be really a pitch for the importance of uh, global models in order to um, understand really what's happening. And I'll argue that it's a picture that's still very blurry at this time. It's early days for this, but I think it's, we're making big improvements. And I'm also happy to not be in triplicate if, uh, if that works, like Sarah. So as Sarah said, there's a lot of stuff happening in the ocean. It's, uh, it's a bit overwhelming. It's easy to feel a sense of panic. It's hard to understand really just how it all fits together and what the most important things are. So, as Sarah was talking about, models are really great synthesis tools um, in order to understand quantitatively just what the heck is happening right now and try to get a sense of prediction for what might happen in the future. What are the big risks and what are the places that we can possibly apply pressure in order to make big improvements in future outcomes? And so I'm going to follow on from Sarah and really making a pitch for the global perspective because I think. Um, the global perspective is important. Often people are suspicious of a global perspective, I think, especially in the marine ecosystem, because we know how complex it is, even looking at a local point. But I don't think that makes the global perspective any less important for a number of reasons. So one is that we have decided as humans, the dominant global species, to throw a party, and we've invited 10 billion people, and there may be 12 billion showing up by the end of the century, according to the more recent projections. So there are big questions. Can we possibly feed that many people? I don't think the answer to that is clear. And how can we maintain healthy ecosystems and avoid widespread extinctions with that many people on the planet? I think these are very pressing questions and they need global models in order to understand. Other things that are useful about global models is that they can address a perception bias from only local studies. If, if you just hear what's happening you know, in Chesapeake Bay or what's happening in Tokyo or what's happening in these local places, it's hard to know whether those stories are biased. Are those just anecdotes? How does it add up in the global picture? I think that's an important thing for communication and understanding. Global perspectives also provide context for what's happening in local environments. Um, I think a really useful thing is that by trying to develop global perspectives, it can show you universal processes that you may actually not notice by focusing on, on local systems. And finally, I think um, both climate and the oceans require global policies. So we, we need these global perspectives in order to support that. And I'm a big believer in the climate model approach. So by that, I mean taking the, the, the world and dividing it into little boxes in which you can solve equations. You start from some initial set of conditions, you solve the equations in each box, and you step forward through time to create a, a virtual planet with interactions within it. Um, and this has been a, a hugely successful and important endeavor for climate science. We all know the, the climate model 
uh, projections, and especially hindcasts. I think hindcasts are a, a, a wonderful thing that the climate model community does very well. So this picture here is showing from the fifth assessment report, uh, global surface air temperature reconstruction in the black line, and then a couple of the climate model ensemble hindcasts in the colored lines. And you're gonna see they, they agree quite well, which gives you some degree of confidence that maybe the models are doing the right things. And even more, you can break down the models into their components. Right, going right. Right, you can break them down into their components. Um, so here this is showing the, the greenhouse gas component of that historical hindcast compared to the natural forcing component dominated by volcanoes. And it's then very clear that most of the historical change can be explained by the model estimate of the greenhouse gas forcing. So this approach really strives for a fundamental basis to the models, I think that's important. It's, it's, you never get exactly to the fundamental physics, but you're always trying to get closer and improve it. Um, you can test the models against past observations, and then this gives you some confidence in the ability to provide future projections on long time scales. So sorry, Alistair, I'm not talking about short term, I'm really talking about long term time scales, wherever you are. And um, as we've already heard actually this morning, uh, I, in trying to do this, you run into this gap between the natural and social sciences, between the people who study the, you know, the biology and the, the physics and the chemistry of the natural science side of things and the people who study the humans um, who don't have the same foundations. You know, they, they tend to be based on looking at things like well-being and, and human values and behavior. And they're not based on physics and chemistry and biology. And so trying to bring those things together is extremely challenging because they're starting from just fundamentally different sets of assumptions and views and approaches. So I really feel that this gap between the natural and social sciences uh, is the most important problem that we have to tackle and we need much more effort to go into that as we've already heard a few times during this conference. And I really feel like because of the long uh, history in this community of dealing with, with fishing, which has you know, brought these two things into conflict for a long time, this community is actually on the cutting edge of trying to address that gap between the natural and social sciences. So, so that's my pitch. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, global fish models. And so this is attempting to go from the climate physics that you get out of the GCM to projecting fish at the global scale. And this is a picture from William Chung's uh, pioneering and very influential paper in uh, 2010. Uh, where they tried to use the, the physical environment changes to say something about changes in the distribution and also the fish catch potential for fisheries at the global scale. And um, there's been a, a, a big growth in the models that are, have been developed in order to try and look at this. We, uh, we started a few years ago the Fish Model Intercomparison Project that has brought together the, the models names that you see up here. This is an open project, it's not a closed club. We've already had a couple more uh, people join this week, so if anybody else would like to join, it's open. It includes both regional focus models, which are on the left, as well as these global models, which I'm talking more about today on the right. And we have uh, a few initial results from the, the fish model, well, it's the Marine Ecosystems and Fisheries Model Intercomparison Project. Uh, so far, these figures are showing the projected global fish biomass um, into the 21st century from a, an early subset of the, the fish mint models. So on the left, the time series there is showing three of the global ocean models, and then on the right, you can see uh, in the ocean, it's showing the change in those same models, average between the models. And it's also showing uh, future changes in estimated food production on land. In, in that paper by Julia Blanchard. So, um, you know, what seems, what we've noticed so far in doing projections with unified forcings in FishMIP is that all of the fish models predict some degree of decrease in global fish biomass under warming uh, during the 21st century, which we didn't actually know going into this, but they all do predict some decrease. So, I, I first want to talk. Um, now, about this. Why is it that these models are predicting reductions in fish biomass over the 21st century under warming? And, and is that correct? And I'm not going to talk about all the models because they're very diverse. They, they use a lot of approaches, different assumptions, different structures. They're trying to resolve different parts of the ecosystem. 
but I'm going to talk about um, an, an approach which is common among many of the global models, which is using body size as a master trait. So the idea is that, that body size determines many features of marine organisms. And there's a beautiful review of, of this by Ken Anderson uh, from a couple of years ago. And so you can use this as, a, as an organizing structure for your model and then essentially follow the flow of energy through these size structured organisms in the marine ecosystem. So it's a very general approach that you can apply globally without too many assumptions. And I'll talk about one specific model. This is uh, the boats model uh, developed in my group, just because I know it well. And uh, so basically, sorry, this is kind of a, a busy figure, but what this is showing is that we take environmental forcings, shown on the left, so we can take these from general circulation model outputs. We take the field of net primary production, uh, monthly, just integrated vertically, and the water temperature from the, the GCM, and then we feed those into equations that resolve fish biomass spectra. So these are the, the biomass in, from small fish going up to large fish bins uh, that are limited by the availability of food and metabolic rates that depend on temperature. Uh, then there is a recruitment term that feeds eggs back into the bottom of the side spectra, and then there is harvest. And the harvest by fishing activities is determined by a, a, a coupled integrated um, economic model that uh, just has very simple uh, dynamics for determining the, the effort based on the catchability, so that's how good the people are at catching fish per unit effort, the ex vessel price of the fish, and the cost per unit effort. So this all happens inside each grid cell of the model independently and interacts together running forward over time. The uncertain parameters are very important in any model. So we designed this model to be computationally efficient so we could run it uh, 10,000 times. You can't, I don't expect you to read everything on the slide, but the idea is to show that we, we spent some time uh, running the model many, many times with different parameter combinations and then comparing it against data to produce an optimized ensemble of different possible parameter combinations that agreed best with the data in order to try and represent the uncertainty in the model uh, through this parameter spread. And then, this is what it shows. So this model sh shows that going through to 2100 with RCP 8.5, so this is the worst case scenario, it predicts a, a total change in fish biomass that looks something like this. And because it's a model, we can split apart the different aspects of how climate change produces this total outcome into its components, according to the model. And what we find is that if we just look at primary production, it produces the map there on the left, which you can see has very, very similar structure to the overall change on the top. And the model also includes an effect of warming temperature and changing primary production on phytoplankton size. So it decreases the phytoplankton size, which therefore increases the trophic length reducing the energy transfer to upper trophic levels, as pointed out by Ryther uh, in 1969. And you can see that that has a generally negative effect as the, the models generally predict phytoplankton shrinking. And then the model also includes temperature effects on mortality, so that's essentially community respiration and predation, natural mortality within the communities, and also on growth rates. So mortality accelerates, which decreases biomass, that's why it's very orange, and uh, growth rates, increase biomass, making it very blue. And you can see that those are large effects, but they go in opposite directions. And so when we integrate these things globally, uh, you get the averages here shown as the circles, and then the ensemble range given by the uncertain parameters shown by the error bars. So you can see uh, the, the, the net primary production has a pretty small effect. That's the pale green. It's so globally integrated. It's not very significant, actually, in this model. What's more significant is the phytoplankton size. The shrinking of phytoplankton by lengthening trophic chains seems to be more important. And then we have these larger effects from the accelerated growth and accelerated mortality, respiration, recycling within the community. And those go in opposite directions. They're quite uncertain. And the overall effect really depends strongly on how big those two opposing changes are, more rapid growth versus more rapid respiration and biomass dissipation. Um, those are important for determining the total. So I'd like to emphasize here that there are really large uncertainties in the models to this point. 
they, we find that they, they tend to have simple and pretty linear behavior. We, t we always construct models to be stable, <laughs> so they always tend to be linear, um, I think. It, it, I don't, we're not aware at this point of, of any tipping points that we've put into these models, so real tipping points in the ecosystems are not represented. Uh, they're missing many processes, and we really need much more close collaboration, I think, between modelers and, and observationalists in order to improve these models. It often tends up being modelers just sitting by themselves, but I think we need, we need more, more fora for, for conversations. So next I'd like to talk about hindcasts. So taking the same climate model approach of doing hindcasts and trying to do this with the coupled human ocean system. So, and, and taking as a target the world catch of wild fish uh, over the 20th century as a target to try to reproduce. So if you're not aware of that this was what it looks like, this is the Sea Around Us project reconstruction. Um, sorry, I forgot the reference. This is, uh, this is Pauli and Zeller, 2016. And uh, you can see there was a large increase through to a plateau that started in the 1990s. So I think looking at this catch history, we would probably agree that this is unlikely to have been driven by climate change. <laughs> it's probably other processes that drove this major change in the catch of fish globally over the 20th century. And so taking that climate change approach where we take the model and then look at different possible components of it, of, uh, of what could have driven this historical change. So here's that observed catch. Now if we take the boats model and force the economics with reconstructed ex vessel price or cost per unit effort, we do not recover the right shape. <laughs> so these are both uncertain. It's hard to calculate the global ex vessel price and the global cost of fishing, but they just don't look right. I mean, there's nothing in those time series that suggests that that, that would have driven on its own the observed increase in fish catch. However, if we look at the other important part of the model, the catchability, which is essentially where the technology goes, so that's the ability of humans to catch fish with a given amount of effort. Um, I mean, all the estimates of technology suggest an increase in technology at rates between 2 and 8% per year. So if we drive the model with that range from 2 to 8% per year, we find that we get about the right increase of uh, catch globally with the central value of 5% per year. It looks roughly the same as, as the historical catch. Does that mean it's right? No, but it's consistent anyway. So this is consistent with technology as having been the main driving force in the global fishery during the 20th century. Oh, sorry, that was, supposed to be, that was supposed to say 20th. 20th century, that was the hindcast. And is that surprising? How many people here think that's surprising? No, of course it's not surprising, right? I mean, this is what fishing boats looked like in the early 20th century. They, they, they had huge numbers of people required to work everything. You know, the ropes were made out of hemp, and they, had, they didn't have refrigeration. I mean, they, they, things have changed so much from that time until today that, of course, this has utterly transformed the way that the global fishery works. So no surprise there, really. It, it just makes sense. Um, but then you have to think, well, if technology has changed at this rate in the past, why would it not continue to change at this rate in the future? I mean, does anybody think that technology has stopped progressing? I don't think so. It doesn't seem like it. So we can then go and see how this might change in the future. So first, I'm just going to reorient you here. So now this plot is showing the same historical period. On the left, I've just compressed it so that we can look out going through to 2100. So this is... This is now uh, including a couple different forcings together and also climate variability, so it looks a bit more bumpy. But so this is basically the technology-driven change with no regulation. So this is open access, zero regulation in the global fishery. And to compare that, I'll show here, this is the maximum sustainable yield um, with perfect harvesting ability and perfect governance. So this is the upper limit to what the model thinks could be sustainably harvested forever. Um, so with a pre-industrial climate, that's in the dashed line, and then with the climate change in the solid blue line. And so you can see that the model thinks that, so m almost all of the historical change has been due to the technology, and the climate effect up until today has been quite small. So if we then project forward these three different things, the pre-industrial the pre maximum sustainable yield, 
climate change maximum sustainable yield, and open access with climate change and 5% per year progress in technology, we end up with these projected futures. So suggesting that the, that if we, with, with zero regulation, the future increases in technology will lead to a drastic decrease in global fish yield. And I don't think this seems intuitively wrong to people who have seen historical progressions in individual fish stocks. It's just the same process writ large. So this suggests that in the future, the technology and socioeconomic again could play a very large role, but in this time, decreasing the global catch. And the climate change, according to this model, is suggested to be actually a smaller uh, change than the potential that could come from overfishing due to large increases in technical capacity. And if we want to try to make this optimistic, I think, is this optimistic? I think we can say that, that this means there's a, a very large scope for improvement in the future through regulation, that actually the importance of regulation is going to increase dramatically through the 21st century. So it's already important and it's just going to get more important as time goes on. Um, according to this viewpoint. So does this make sense? I mean, I often find that when I talk to people about this, yes, it makes sense that technology was important in the past, but really, is it really gonna get better in the future? Like, isn't this kind of as good as it gets? And I think you can, if you think about it for a while, you can see that there are many things happening that will make it better. I mean, one of the most obvious things is just deployment of existing technology to the huge parts of the world where people are still using relatively simple technology. So just that can make a huge difference worldwide. There's, and then there's all kinds of new techn technological things coming, fish forecasts, we're going to have Argo floats out there with acoustics on them, and then for sure those are going to help people understand better fish behavior and where the big aggregations are and, and get short-term forecasts of exactly where the fish are so we can target and catch every last one of them. And we won't even have to go ourselves, we'll have robot fishermen. This is actually a real robot fisherman. <laughs> that thing goes out and vacuums up invasive lionfish by itself, underwater, so essentially no human cost. You don't have to pay any labor for the, that to catch fish. So for sure there are new things coming. So management is going to be very important, and it's just one last thing I'll mention here. Uh, this is just a, a plug for some work that my PhD student Kim Scherer is, is doing, uh, putting dynamic regulation into these models. So this is just showing what happens. So, so there's the no regulation, uh, open access, version on the right with increasing technology, and then there's some regulation in the middle and perfect regulation on the right. So you see the some regulation does quite well until kind of the mid 21st century, but then it actually tends to crash as well um, as the technology improves more and more and more. And so there's just this, this increasing importance for very high quality regulation and management as the technological incentive to overfish becomes stronger and stronger. So I'll summarize. So I think we really need these global predictive models in order to envision and quantify possible futures uh, as a global species. The existing global fish models so far unanimously predict a decrease of fish biomass due to climate change, but I would stress that these remain highly uncertain, and, but they also lack tipping points, so things could be better than they predict or worse. The non-climate human factors appear to be of comparable or potentially greater importance, and I've focused on technology here, but of course there are many other things going on as well that I think we need to bring into this, this perspective. We can counter climate change impacts to a large degree uh, by improving fisheries regulations at the global scale. And I really think that uh, a critical thing that we need more effort on in science in general is to work on this natural social science integration to build unified ways to look at the, the human earth system. So thanks very much. Thank you very much, Eric, for a, a very interesting new development in the, in the field of uh, fisheries projection and how to use them and how to incorporate regulations into them. I'm sure there'll be a few questions on the table, right? You have, so I've got one over here. Please, those that want to have a question, please um, head yourselves towards the microphones in the aisle. Thank you, first one. Okay, uh, hi, Andy Pershing from the Gulf Maine Research Institute. Fantastic talk. Um, I'm really curious, I, I love your idea of the, you know, the gap between natural and social science and, and your, your last analysis sort of showing how they potentially interact. I'm curious how you and your team have thought about the uh, the social assumptions that are underlying the climate projections themselves, in that RCP 8.5 is a world where humans are essentially unconstrained 
in their use of carbon, has particular economic assumptions, has particular assumptions about population dynamics of people and our food requirements and how, that, how you think that would interact with the, uh, uh, with the, the catch dynamics and the, the fisheries in your, in your models. I mean, that, yeah, super interesting question. I mean, there's so many interesting questions when you, you really start to get into the coupling between the humans and the, the natural world. We haven't tried to look at that um, yet. What, we're, what we are trying to head towards you know, uh, looking at human behavior in a more direct way that is related to human well-beings and, and behavioral motivations. Um, also looking at population pressures and, and how that relates to, to fishing pressures, especially in, in small-scale fisheries. We tend to just use the RCP 8.5, not because we think it's most likely, but just because it's the biggest hammer. So if you're not sure how something works and you just want to see, hit it with the biggest signal first. I hope we're not actually going to RCP 8.5 for, for many reasons, but um, that's why we tend to focus on that so far. But th th there's a lot of stuff to think about here, for sure. Yeah. Thank you. I've got uh, two questions from the left and then one in the center here. Hello. Uh, good morning. I'm Franklin Gormasa from Ecuador, uh, oceanographer. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Very nice. Uh, compilation of your, your, your work. Um, however, I think I have a, a comment and then a question. Uh, as we can saw, uh, we saw from the, well, what, uh, what you show was that the, the, all the model was regarding uh, industrial fisheries, according to the picture and, and what you said. And, uh, but uh, artisanal fisheries uh, are a very important uh, part of the fisheries. Just to talk about Ecuador, it's a little example. In Ecuador, there are 100,000 fishermen, artisanal fishermen. There are 19,000 boats growing every day. And there are 200, 200 uh, big boats. So uh, at least in Ecuador, the artisanal fisheries. Uh, sorry, can you, can you get to the question? Because otherwise we're not oh, going to okay, have okay. to So uh, why you don't integrate the the artisanal fishery within the model, which is, I think, is a big, a big part of, of all the fishers. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I completely agree. And actually, so the other project that Kim is working on, as well as uh, my postdoc, Sarah Mignaro, they're working exactly on trying to integrate artisanal fishers. But it's difficult because they're not driven by the same profit motive. So, this is, so we're really trying to get into you know, how much it's driven by food security, how much it's just tradition that people just fish regardless. So we're trying to bring that in at the grid scale now as well. But yeah, thanks for the question. Thank you. Next question. Uh, Jason Holt from the National Oceanography Centre. Um, I do completely agree with taking a global approach here. However, one big gap between the si social science and the natural sciences is the scales of interactions and particularly between the, the global approach um, and the information that you can get from global climate models and the experience of individual fishing countries at potentially much finer scale or, or individuals. Have you any thoughts about how to reconcile that gap? Uh, so sorry, you mean through like management at national levels? Yeah, I, I mean yeah. essentially how do you communicate your global answer of a decrease in fisheries to to what an individual country or region might experience right okay so we do that by splitting up the so in the in the dynamic management we we use uh, exclusive economic zones so what happens within an exclusive economic zone then determines whether or not the a, a fisheries management regime comes into play and can feed back with the uh, effectiveness of that fisheries management system but this is still in development so i didn't really show that stuff and do they generally follow the global picture? Well, I mean, I think it's, so we're kind of, we've struggled to find good data in order to, to really understand how much countries differ, but it's pretty clear that there's a lot of variation between how effective countries can be. Um, it's, there's some kind of correlation to the Human Development Index, so we played around with using that, but obviously there's more to it than that as well. So I think that's a big research question. Thank you. I'm afraid we'll only have time for one more question. Uh, Andreas Oschlis, uh, Geomark here, Germany. Thanks very much, Eric. Uh, you, you're worried about the absence of or the lack of um, uh, tipping points, which may, may be present but not yet in the models. Do you think positive feedbacks are missing, like feedbacks, top-down controls, fishing on 
biogeochemistry on psi spectra, which may then well amplify uh, any responses, any perturbations. Does it matter this very large top-down role that we don't have yet in the models? Yeah, so I, I totally, uh, I, I hope that there are positive <laughs> processes that we're missing, that would be great. Um, and I, I agree, we, we still have pretty, we have very sketchy understandings of how the biogeochemistry is affected. I think that the French group has actually now a coupled uh, fish biogeochemical model that they're running, so hopefully we'll have some, some better insight on that soon. And I think and a really huge uncertainty is how the trophic efficiency could change in these systems. I think we have very poor understanding, and there is leverage there. It's such a huge factor that if the trophic efficiency does go up in some of these systems, we could actually see some compensation. So we can hope so. But that's right. Let's look for those. Great. Can you please uh, help me just uh, thank Eric for his presentation? <laughs> <laughs>